Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our beginner livestock series. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about small ruminants, so that would be sheep and goats. Um, just as a reminder, please stay muted um, with your cameras off. And if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the chat. Um, so just as a note, I'm not going to really be touching on like dairy goats and dairy sheep, um, just because that's like a whole other thing um, with like milk production and stuff like that. But you know that a lot of the management practices are going to be pretty similar uh, between those and the sheep and goats used for meat. Um, so just as a reminder, this is an eight part series. So this is our sixth session here. Um, after this, we just have two more. Um, just as a note for anyone who maybe missed some of the others, we do have the recordings available to watch. Um, and your one registration covers the whole series. So if you haven't, uh, if you registered later and you haven't received the others, please just let us know. We can send those out to you, no problem. So to start off with just a basic overview of the production cycle of sheep and goats, um, small ruminants in general are a very much a smaller sector of the overall livestock industry. Um, here in the US, there's about 5 million sheep and about 2.5 million um, goats as compared to about 30 million cattle. So it's still kind of a little bit more of a niche market, though I think that over the years recently, it's been growing for sure. Um, so to start off here on the left, we have um, the flock of sheep or your herd of goats that um, is, the purpose of that is to produce, you know, the lambs and kids that will then um, move on through the cycle. Um, so ewes and does typically will have twins. And in fact, that is the ideal scenario. We really want them to have twins um, as much as possible because that will increase uh, their production value um, within the herd because then you have more product to sell, whether you're selling those as uh, live animals or as um, down the line as meat. Um, so lambs will typically be weaned at about eight weeks old and goat kids about six to eight weeks old. So that's when they are separated from their mothers and separated from milk as a source of nutrition. And then really the where they go for, it kind of depends on what area of the United States there are. Um, in the Midwest, there's definitely some like lamb feedlots um, for feeding those lambs to market weights. They're not as prominent um, here on the East Coast, though the East Coast is more structured um, in general towards smaller um, livestock farms than the Midwest is. Um, but when they get to a typical market weight, uh, lambs will be about 90 to 120 pounds and they'll reach that about five months of age. And just as a note, when you see lamb in the stores, that is any meat from um, a sheep that is under a year old. If it's over a year old, then it's referred to as mutton. So because it's not, with older sheep, it's not as tender um, or flavorful as what it would be from a younger animal. So for goats, they still reach market weight at about five to six months of age, just like lambs do, but they are much smaller as their typical market weight is about 15 to 90 pounds. So then once they're slaughtered, you'll see on the right here, there's some hanging carcasses. And so that meat can then be, um, can be marketed, whether you have that or marking that directly, or you are, um, you know, if you've sold those through like auctions or something like that. And of course, we always have to have um, animals that are staying in the herd, you know, females, or if you're keeping any rams and bucks for breeding yourself, um, they have to, they'll be coming back to the herd to replace those older ewes and does as they are, you know, um, having other problems, not being productive anymore, um, or things like that. So just kind of briefly touch on these like infrastructure stuff, just because we've already talked about that in our intro to livestock session. But just as a reminder, one animal, we typically recommend there's one animal unit per acre and one animal unit would be 1000 pounds of animal. So for sheep and goats, that means you could have probably, you know, four to five of goats or sheep per acre um, for, uh, because of their such smaller size. And then shelter wise, about 15 to 20 square feet per animal if you have a barn or, you know, a shed or some kind of structure that, uh, keep them away from the elements and uh, keep them warmer and dry and things like that. And then we recommend 1.5 to two feet of feeder space if you're feeding any kind of grain supplementation. 
And of course, as always, you definitely need good fencing. They always need water available at all times and those other structures that we've talked about previously. So to start off kind of talking about some of the major sheep breeds, um, I really couldn't talk about every sheep breed because there are probably hundreds of different breeds of sheep. Um, and some of them are from uh, crossbreeding, you know, you've made some new breeds have come about in more recent years as well. But we're just going to talk about some of the more familiar ones. So this group that I have on the screen here are uh, sheep specifically bred for meat production. So they are, they have better muscling when they grow. Um, and they also have a lower quality wool. So if marketing their wool won't be as profitable because it's less ideal, generally more coarse. Um, and especially with the Suffolk and Hampshire on the top there uh, where they have the black wool that is let, it won't take the dye as well as uh, some of the wool breeds. So then here are just a few examples of some common wool breeds. And so these are animals that won't uh, muscle as well, but their, the quality of their fiber of their wool is a lot better. And then we also have breeds that were bred kind of going towards uh, both of those goals, having good meat as well as high quality wool. And so these are called dual purpose breeds. Um, generally one of the more common ones in the US would be the Dorset breed right here. And then additionally, we have breeds of sheep called hair sheep. So they don't grow wool at all. And some of the advantages of hair sheep and be why they're becoming more, po more popular recently is that they are a lot hardier. They're, uh, they're more tolerant of like warmer climates. So you'll see like the St. Croix, I believe originated in the Caribbean because they can tolerate that heat. And these breeds are also more parasite resistant which is really a really um, good thing with small ruminants because they do have so many parasite problems, which we're gonna get into a little bit later. And then, so for meat goats, there's um, several different breeds of those. I just have a couple examples. When you think of meat goats in the US, the most common breed you've probably seen or heard of would be the boar goats. Um, those goats are really known for their really good muscling and high quality meat. Um, and then we also have Kiko goats, and the myotonic goats, which are you've probably heard of as fainting goats. Um, so they have some kind of um, physiological thing where if they're spooked, they instantly freeze up and then just kind of fall over like they're fainting. And so regardless of whether they're sheep or goats, they all do have certain behaviors in common. Um, they all, you know, they have herds and flocks, they kind of like to stay with them. A sheep really take that to a greater degree though. They really hate being separated from their, their flock um, and hate being singled out. Uh, goats are a little more curious and independent. If you've ever had goats or been around goats, you know that they kind of want to be all up in your business all the time um, if they're able to get to you, like if you're in their pasture or something like that. But even there are still some basic principles for all of them and just for livestock in general that we can talk about here. So you see this circle is the flight zone of the animal. And so that's how close you can be to the animal before it starts to move away from you. Um, so some animals are, you know, you, their flight zones are very small, so you can get really close before they feel like they need to move away. And then some have a much larger um, flight zone, so you won't be able to get as close to them before they're trying to get away. And here, another important thing is this point of balance right here, which is right at the point of their shoulder. And that's the point where if you're in front of it, they want to turn around and move away from you. And if you're behind it, they want to move forward. So that's, if you use these principles, you can manipulate how they're going to move and get them to where you want them to go. So as you can see right here, uh, where the handler's movement is, uh, you can see they're standing outside the flight zone. And then if they move here inside the flight zone, then the animal's going to move away from them. Additionally, with sheep and goats, they can see about 270 degrees around them, so almost a full circle. But here's this blind spot to where if you're directly behind them, they can't really see uh, where you are and what you're doing there. So there are different ways that you can safely handle um, these animals. Here we have some like examples of shoot systems here. Um, and so here's like a corral and the crowd pen, and then they'll go up one by one. So then you're better able to uh, get them into the shoot at the end. 
and it just makes it a lot easier than trying to catch them out of pasture or something. And here you see the sheep in the chute where you can do whatever you need to do. You can get to his feet. You can do like give medicine at its head. And you can see the circle here. This is also a turntable um, shoot. So like here, if you need to get to their hooves, then you can just turn them on their side and very easily reach their feet there. But not everyone has a shoot system or not everyone. Um, sometimes maybe you just have some sheep in a pen and you don't want to have to run them all the way through the shoot. So there is a technique to flip the sheep to um, or goat and be able to set them like here. And then once they're sitting on their butt, they can't really uh, move and you can kind of give it medicine or check its feet, whatever you need to do. So what this person is doing, they're in the middle of trying to flip the sheep. So what they do is they you kind of hold on under the chin and you're going to pull it towards you from its opposite side, pull the head over its shoulder. And as you pull the head over its shoulder, you're gonna push down on its butt. And so it gets unbalanced as it pulls its head over the shoulder and then it will be on the ground and you then you just uh, pick its front end up like this and you can lean it against your legs and do whatever you need to do. And this is done in a lot of different times when you need to just perform different management tasks, if you need to check you know, the health status of it or give a medicine. Um, and so one way, there are also with sheep and goats, since they are pretty easy to handle and they're, because they're of their smaller size, that there is a way that you can age the sheep, meaning you can tell how old it is just by looking at its mouth. So all lambs and kids are born with these very small milk teeth, but then as they get older, those milk teeth fall out and they're replaced by their larger permanent incisors. So for about every year, they will get one more pair of those incisors until they're four and then they have their full set of eight incisors. I um, mean, you notice they also don't have top teeth on the front, but they do have top teeth in the back where they have their molars where they do their chewing. Um, so this one here is one year old because you can see the distinct difference in size between this large incisor and these smaller milk teeth in the back. Hoof trimming is another really important management uh, management task that you have to do this. Uh, taking care of their feet reduces their chances of lameness as their hoof wall can get a little bit overgrown. And also when you are working on them, you can also check for other things with foot health like abscesses or if they have anything stuck in their toes or things like that, if you notice any kind of foot rot. Um, and so you can see here, the hoof trimmers, they kind of look like garden shears. I um, mean, it's just like if you were trimming like a dog's nails, you want to make sure that you keep an eye out for like the quick of the nail. Um, so you don't want them to, you don't want to hit that because that's going to hurt um, and then bleed. But um, you can see he's just trimming like around this hoof wall where you can see it's kind of overgrown. And then they can walk more comfortably. Um, but if you do hit the blood vessel, then you can just use some kind of like antiseptic or like iodine just to make sure they're not going to get an infection in that spot. And of course, specifically for sheep, you do have to think about shearing unless you have um, one of the hair sheep breeds. And shearing is generally done once a year. And it's there's several reasons that it's done. For one, um, it does keep the sheep cool in the summertime. So you're gonna wanna shear like in the spring. And then that wool has time to grow back um, through the fall and into the winter, keep them warm. This also is a um, hygiene thing. It keeps them a lot cleaner. There's not if you're shearing the wool, there's not a ton of uh, manure buildup, hopefully, which reduces their chance of getting something called fly strike, which is where um, blowflies will lay eggs kind of in the manure in the back end of the sheep. And then the, when those larvae hatch, then they're going to try and start um, feeding on the sheep, actually, which is, you know, obviously a really big problem. And then, of course, the wool also is a, another product that can't, you can sell if you are raising sheep or you can you know, use it yourself if, you're, um, if you make crafts or things like that. Um, so shearing can be done by, you know, if you just have sheep, it can be done by anyone. They have these hand shears for cutting. And then you can see in this picture on the left, they actually have an electric shear, which is just like um, a clipper. Um, but if you have a lot of sheep, then sometimes it also can be worth it to hire a professional shearer to come in um, and shear your sheep. So when you're raising sheep and you want to 
um, improve your herd or improve your flock and how they're performing. Um, you really wanna keep good records about their performance data because then you can use that data to make your selections to determine you know, which, you, which ewes or rams that you wanna keep and which ones you wanna get rid of to continue um, or does and bucks to continue to improve your herd. So some of the different performance traits that you wanna look at are uh, the growth of your lambs and kids, not just from a perspective of those animals were growing well um, to pass on their genetics, but also because then their dams are doing a good job, you know, mothering them and um, contributing to their growth and things like that. So, and also disease resistance, when you're monitoring um, your parasite loads, or you may be thinking about uh, doing some crossbreeding with hair sheep or things like that, thinking about those kind of disease resistance, which can you know really help you out down the line if your sheep are more resistant to different problems. And you can also use genetic information. Um, that's a little bit less common in sheep and goats than it is like in the cattle industry. The cattle industry has a really robust um, system of doing these EPDs. And what the EPDs or expected progeny differences are is that they are uh, basically summaries of and averages that compare how the offspring of one animal will do versus the offspring of another. And so really it's just, they take different traits and they collect a lot of performance data from offspring to get kind of an estimate of the genetic merit of that animal. And so some of the different traits that are measured are um, like the number of lambs born to a ewe, um, the pounds of lambs weaned, um, the lamb growth itself at 60 or 90 days, um, as well as there being EPDs for wool qualities as well, such as the length of the fiber, the feel of the fiber, and things like that. Um, for goats, this isn't really, EPDs aren't typically even, are, aren't typically used um, even less than sheep, which um, as I mentioned, are used a lot less than with cattle. So when you're raising uh, ruminants in general, including small ruminants, it's really important to keep in mind how their digestive system works, because that's really going to be the basis for their whole nutrition program here. So ruminants have a stomach that has four compartments shown here, and you can see that each compartment has a very distinctive uh, texture and very distinctive uh, structure to that compartment. So as I mentioned that uh, sheep and goats, they don't have top teeth in the front. So what they kind of do is they use their tongues or they use their lips to kind of rip off the uh, plants that they're eating and they swallow them whole and they don't chew them at the time. So then there's a lot of microbes in the room. And so what those microbes are doing are they're working and they're digesting uh, breaking down that food stuff. So then the small ruminant will regurgitate it and then they'll chew it back with their molars. So then as it's getting to be smaller and smaller particle sizes as they're chewing it and the microbes are breaking it down, then it kind of is filtered through the reticulum here. And so this is structured to be able to uh, catch those smaller particles and then move them to the omasum, which has a lot of folds here to increase the surface area because that's where a lot of water is absorbed. If once all of these things are really broken down, this water is absorbed, then it moves on to the abomasum, which as you can see is a lot like our stomachs. Um, so it's called sometimes nicknamed the true stomach and it has you know, hydrochloric acid, a lot of digestive enzymes. And so that's where more of the chemical breakdown of the feed happens after the mechanical breakdown happening in the other compartments. And then it moves along to the small intestine. Um, so most of the absorption of nutrients will happen in the small intestine, but uh, another unique thing about ruminants is that there is these, uh, the microbes that are digesting all of this feed, they produce volatile fatty acids. And so those are actually absorbed directly through the rumen wall. These microbes also produce microbial proteins. So um, this is part of the reason why ruminants are able to get more protein than what other like monogastrics could get from grass and stuff because those microbes produce protein and then the microbes are digested as well. Um, of course at birth, lambs and kids do not have a functioning rumen because at that time they're only drinking milk. They're not uh, fully developed enough to be able to eat grass and be able to use that 
uh, nutrition nutrients from the grass. So there's a groove that will, um, a mus kind of a muscular fold called the esophageal groove that will come up and direct the milk as it uh, comes from the suckling um, pathway or like suckling stimulates this groove to form that will direct the milks through to the omasum abomasum because otherwise it doesn't need to be fermented in the rumen like other feedstuffs do. So keeping in mind how the ruminant digestive system works, the base of the diet for sheep and goats really needs to be based around forages um, like grass um, and things like that. Goats actually um, prefer to be more browsers than grazers. So meaning they like to eat um, leaves off of taller plants or like stems, shoots um, and other things um, that are a little bit tougher to eat and that's just their preference, but they will course, eat grass. Um, so for them, no matter what, whether they're grazing or browsing, they do need two to four percent of their body weight in dry matter every day for just for maintenance. And of course, there are a lot of factors that can uh, bump up these numbers and their requirements. So some of these things are uh, their stage of lactation, their milk production level, because as they're producing milk, they need more energy to um, that they're passing on to their young. Um, their size has a factor, body condition, um, the weather, because they're going to eat more when it's cold because they need to metabolize that to keep them warm. And then also the palatability of the forage can also affect this. So if it's more palatable, they're going to want to eat more of it because it's going to be um, less fiber and lower or less fiber and higher quality energy source, which means that they're going to eat more of it because it will be moving through the digestive system faster. If you have a lower quality feed and it is higher fiber, then it's going to kind of slow down that process. They're going to be full for longer and they're not going to eat as much. And so just to reiterate what we talked about in our forages thing, that it's really important that you test your forages so you know how much dry matter, you know how many minerals, how much energy, protein, and things like that. So you know if you need to do any kind of grain supplementation. So grain obviously should not be the predominant part of the diet because if you feed them too much grain, then that's going to really upset the microbes and they're going to produce more um, stomach acid and it's going to drop the pH and cause a lot of problems um, in their stomachs. But it can be sometimes important if the forage is not meeting their needs for either protein or energy, you can do grain supplementations to bump that up. So you might want to do this with like I'm lactating you because she needs, she just needs more because she's um, at the highest production level of the year. You can also do creep feeding for lambs and kids as shown in this picture here. And so creep feeding is just where the young can get through to reach the grain, but these openings are not big enough to allow the grown um, adult ewes and does to get in, to get into that feed. And so that's just to help the young, um, for one, kind of get used to eating grain a little bit and also to give them a little bit of extra growth. So a typical complete feed that you might use to supplement um, probably is gonna be a 12% crude protein, um, but crete feeds should be 16 to 18% because those young need more protein as they're growing. Minerals are also a really important part because minerals are involved in so many different pathways and functions in our body, um, but depending on what you've tested your forages at or what kind of grain supplementation you have, um, this may or may not be necessary. But if it is, you can provide it in a lot of different ways. Of course, it could be mixed in with their feed. Um, you can also have it free choice as either a lick or just have loose minerals. Um, but there is one thing that you really need to pay attention to a sheep and that is copper. Um, copper can cause a lot of problems with sheep. They are very susceptible to copper toxicity because they're not able to dispose of excess copper as fast. So it kind of gets stored up in their liver and they can't dispose as, as much. And so then when they're stressed, they just release all of that in kind of a big wave and it can cause a breakdown of their red blood cells, which can in extreme cases lead to death. So you really wanna make sure if you're doing any kind of mineral supplement or if you're feeding any a feed that has minerals in it, you want to make sure that it is labeled specifically for sheep if you're a sheep because then they won't have the added copper 
that could cause a lot of problems because goats don't really aren't as sensitive. So you want to make sure that if you have sheep, you're getting a sheep feed or mineral. So now just as a reminder of grazing management, and we talked about in our forages how you don't really want to have your animals just continuously grazing in one pasture all the time, because then they're going to start to get really selective of other plants they want to eat. They're going to leave the weeds, and then the weeds are going to keep growing, and eventually they're going to take up more of your pasture space. And it's also better for the soil if these animals aren't, you know, treading on the same places over and over again, having their kind of like established pathways, um, and leading to a lot of compaction and things like that. So here are a couple examples of some different strategies you can use. So here we have rotational grazing, and then we also have strip grazing. And a lot of times with strip grazing, people might do just some temporary fence um, to then open it up and let the animals into the next section. And then either back fencing to keep them out of where they've already been, or sometimes you don't uh, necessarily do that, and just give them more space as over time. And one of those reasons that these strategies are important is to prevent overgrazing. So you can see here's kind of how the plant is growing when it's grazed. So after it's grazed, it has a lot of roots, but then the root stores are used to produce more leaves. Um, so then the, uh, of course, the leaves of the water, the photosynthesis happens to bring more energy into the plant. And then so you can see here now it's starting to grow more leaves, but the roots have not come back to where they were. So then if you graze it then, then the, once these roots are more depleted, then it's kind of kind of kill the plant. And then you're going to have bare spots in your pasture. You're not going to have these, the ideal plants that um, might be better more ideal forage crops in your pasture. And so here's another showing of a research project that looked at this. And so this was showing a more continuous grazing. And then this and this later one is allowing the pastures to rest for adequate time. You can see how much more root growth um, has occurred. And that's going to be really important to have a stable pasture system. So then kind of moving on to something that's a little bit related, looking at body condition scores. So body condition scores is an indicator of um, your nutritional, the, the nutrition that they are getting um, because it's how much fat is found on the body. Um, so if they're meeting their needs, then they're gonna be a good body condition. If they're not, they're gonna start to get thinner. But of course with um, sheep, you can't necessarily tell fatness just by looking at them, like you can with like a cow. So the way we do it for sheep and goats is you're gonna feel right here along the spine, and that's where you're gonna do your body condition scoring as shown by this chart. So here, when you're feeling um, on the spine, like what we saw in the picture, you can feel here's the spine and here's this transverse, transverse processes. And so you'll be able to tell as you feel how much fat is on there, and here at the obese, you really can't even feel the spine at all. And you really wanna avoid, um, of course you wanna avoid being, them being too thin and emaciated, but you also wanna avoid them being obese because that can cause some metabolic problems. Um, and it also causes issues with using does when they're lambing. If they have a lot of fat deposits near um, their rump, then that can cause problems that they'll be less able to deliver on um, the lambs of the kids. So. Of course, this does fluctuate um, as they go through their production cycle. So use that um, just weaned or does that just weaned kids. Um, they might be a little more on the thin side to average, but then once they are able to bring their body condition back up, then maybe they're getting more into the um, higher in the three, close to the four range. So when you're talking about reproduction, um, here in the US, the major and probably I think in the world, the majority of breeding is done by uh, the producers having rams or bucks um, in their herd. And so when you're doing this, it's really important before the breeding season to do a breeding soundness exam on the ram. And so that looks at a couple different things, such as there's a physical exam, which is just, uh, you know, can, is the ram in good body condition? Is he going to be able to 
um, you know, deplete his stores as he's, you know, doing his job? And does he have good mobility and structural soundness? So is he going to be able to mount the use or doze um, to breed them? Because that's really important because if you have a ram or buck that's lame, then they're really not going to be able to um, mount the animals. So the other, another part of the breeding soundness exam is examining their reproductive organs. So that's looking at the uh, scrotal circumference, palpating the testicles to make sure there's no abnormalities or any kind of problems. And then also taking a sample of semen to look at the uh, motility and the morphology of the sperm to make sure that he's actually going to be unfertile um, and be able to get those user does bred. And you can see here is a marking called a marking harness or a breeding harness. And this is to indicate which ewes have been bred by the ram. And you can see here, it's basically just like a crayon. And so then it will mark the ewes that he mounts. And so that's a good way so you know who's been bred, who might still be open, maybe who isn't cycling at all if she's not coming to heat. Um, and also if you have more than one ram, you can use different colors that might indicate uh, which ram bred which you or which buck bred which doe. And a much smaller segment of the industry is artificial insemination or AI. And previously, uh, the only way to get good conception rates would be through laparoscopic artificial insemination as shown here, which is where a veterinarian would actually go in um, with an ultrasound to see what they're doing and then a needle um, to then insert the semen directly into the uterus. Um, now there is a growing push to develop and improve the non-surgical techniques, which would be like going in through um, the vagina and depositing the semen into the cervix. Um, previously, they didn't have very good conception rates with that, but um, since, because this is a newer technology, they're constantly working to improve that and improve the technique to be able to get those bred. But if you are doing artificial insemination, you also have to think about how to store semen, whether you're going to get it fresh, whether you're going to get it frozen, um, and how long that will last. You have to think about some of those things. When looking at the females, um, the estrous cycle, which would be the equivalent to the menstrual cycle in people, though it's, um, it's different the way it works, but sheep and goats are seasonally polyestrous, which means that they um, come into, they are cycling more at certain times of the year, it's not consistent throughout the whole year. And so for them, it's affected by the photo period, which is how much light um, there is during the day. Um, so with sheep and goats, they generally are, uh, will be coming, they will be cycling in the fall because then that will lead to um, them giving birth in the spring. Um, but there are different ways that this can be manipulated so you can breed out of season um, and be able to breed them in the spring to get lambs in the fall. And there are certain breeds like Dorsets, um, Rambouillets, or polyface sheep that are, um, easy, that are easier to be able to manipulate. They are more apt to be cycling out of season. Um, but some of the ways that you can manipulate that is one of the ways that works the best is using light therapy, which is basically mimicking the decrease in daylight hours um, that happens naturally in the fall and you're kind of recreating that inside using actual lights in the winter time and gradually decreasing the amount of light they get so then they will be coming into um, cyclicity in the spring. It also can help um, in addition to that using exposure to a ram or buck um, through a fence so if you remove the male from being anywhere near the herd so they can't see him they can't smell or hear him um, for a, a couple months, and then you bring him back into an adjacent pen or pasture, and sometimes that can start the use and doe cycling. Um, but that works better if you're just trying to extend the breeding season or bring them into um, cycling earlier, and not so much if you're trying to do it the totally opposite time of year. And then there are also estrus synchronization programs um, and protocols that we can do using exogenous hormones. Um, whether that's through um, kind of an insert that goes into the vagina called a cedar or uh, using um, injectable hormones as well. For the estrus cycle, as you can kind of see, here's the different hormones level. I'm not really going to go into depth through a lot of this, um, but this cycle happens 
um, every about every 17 days for use and about every 21 days for dose. Um, and then here, the part to really pay attention to here is this standing heat or estrus. I noticed the different spelling between that estrus and this estrus. Um, and so this is where it's the period of sexual receptivity. So where those use and does are open to the male coming in um, to breed them. And so that's when uh, he's gonna come in to breed them or if you're doing artificial insemination, that's when um, a little bit after that is when you would want to inseminate those use or does. So a lot of different um, factors that you can think about whether you're deciding whether you want to um, do spring or fall lambing or kidding. Um, so in the forage wise, you wanna be thinking about your feed resources. If you're lambing in the spring, then later on as these lambs or kids are getting bigger, then you are going to have plenty of forage resources because as the grass is growing in the spring, but when they're first lamb or kidding, you're not gonna have as many resources when the user are in heavy lactation like you would in the fall. Because in the fall, of course, we're getting toward the end of the summer, there's plenty of grass and those ewes will have plenty of resources um, to be able to feed their young. Also, weather can be a factor is depending on whether you would want to deal with that. So in the fall, the weather's gonna be really nice when um, ewes are lambing because it's not gonna be too cold yet probably but you then do have to pay attention to those younger animals um, making it through the winter and being able to keep them warm. Whereas in the spring, you kind of have the opposite. Later on, as they get bigger, they're fine, but it might still be a little bit of cold when they're giving birth. So you wanna make sure that you might have a heat lamp um, that you could put on these uh, lambs to be able to keep them, keep their body temperature up. And then also there are different market factors. If you're looking to market um, your animals, since most lambs are born in the spring, generally uh, fall born lambs come into the market when there's lower supply and so prices would be higher. But then there's also a lot of um, ethnic holidays that have, are happening in the spring where people want younger lambs. And so having spring born lambs will be able to take care or take advantage of those factors. So there's three different stages. Um, of giving birth in livestock animals. So you have first the cervix dilation, which is usually about 12 to 24 hours. Um, and there will be some kind of discharge during this time before then the uterus starts contracting in the delivery phase. So the time that it takes for delivery really varies. Um, of course, as I mentioned that, you know, ideally they will have twins and sometimes less than ideally they might have triplets. And so that can vary um, how long they will take to give birth. But this is also when the water bag will break and there will be one for each um, offspring that that animal is delivering. And so then finally, after delivery, um, the placenta will be expelled, um, hopefully 30 to 60 minutes, or maybe it might take a couple hours. But if it hasn't been expelled by 24 hours, then you really need to talk to your vet because there could be a problem. Um, this could also lead to being prone to infection um, for that you or doe. So here's just a graphic of some of the normal presentations. Here we have, if we have a single lamb that it's still considered, typically the presentation would be front feet first with the head between the legs. But even if they're just totally backwards, that's still considered normal presentation. It would still be a fairly easy birth. I'm um, here with twins. You're gonna have kind of one facing one way, one facing the other way. And then we have a lot of different abnormal presentations where if the, um, lambs or kids were in these presentations, then they might have to be helped out um, to be able to kind of move around, uh, like bring this foot forward and move the head around for the you or doe to be able to actually give birth. So once the newborns are born, um, typically you want to um, move those pairs or trios if she had, depending on whether she had a single um, or twins into what's called a jug. So a jug is this small pen here, and you're gonna to wanna to keep those in there for about 24 to 48 hours, because that really allows the mothers to really bond with those offspring and be able to, you know, for that mother to know, okay, you know, these are mine and to be in the a young to bond. So they know how to find each other once they're back in with the flock of the herd. And so, um, once the you or doe expels the placenta, you want to make sure that you take that out of the jug. They might want to eat it, which is not a problem, but 
just for keeping the uh, pen dry, you want to get that out of there because there's going to be a lot of like fluid and stuff with that. You also want to dip the navels of the young in iodine just to prevent any kind of infection for any bacteria that might come up there um, and get into their body cavity. And if you're not sure, if hopefully um, the you or the dough is all done with the birthing process because you really want, don't want to disturb them during. But if you're really unsure, you might want to palpate the dam just to make sure that there, she doesn't have any more uh, babies inside of her. Because if they stay inside, then that could cause her problems down the road. And of course, when they're these smaller pens, it's a good way to monitor them for um, just make sure they're doing okay, they're getting up, they're eating, they're nursing, um, and things like that. And then you can, after you know a day or two, you can then move them back into maybe smaller group pens, um, and then eventually back with the whole flock. So before you move them, you really want to make sure that you have tagged them and written down which tag numbers are who, so then you know uh, which lambs are which and which you they go to or kids with does. Um, it's also a good idea when they're a few weeks old to do tail docking with woolly sheep. Um, and so the reason that tail docking is done is because it is kind of a, it's more of a health um, issue that if having those tails really can contribute to them getting fly strike or having, because there's a lot of like manure in that area. Um, and so docking the tail will reduce the risk. And where you wanna dock, you use these kind of elastrator bands, which is the same that you can use for castrating. Um, and this, you will, when you squeeze these pliers and this will open up and you'll be able to get it over the tail. And you wanna do it right at the end of these caudal folds here. And so you wanna make sure that you're not doing it too close because if you do that too close to their rump, then that could cause them problems with um, increased risk of rectal prolapses, which is where um, kind of the um, colon and the inside then kind of pokes out and that could lead to infection and things like that. And so then if you put this band on, what it's gonna do, and the same with um, castrating the males, is that it will cut off the blood circulation and eventually that tissue will fall off after a couple of weeks. So one thing that's a lot more of a problem with small ruminants than it is with other animals are predators. Because of course they're smaller animals, less able to fight off um, animals, as well as them being predominantly kept out in pastures and not always you know, where you can see them. So there are different ways that you can kind of try to control um, predators, one of them being guard animals, when um, you can use dogs, uh, typically Great Pyrenees tend to be um, a really good choice for that. Also llamas or donkeys can protect the flock against predators like coyotes, um, dogs, including domestic dogs, which sometimes can be a real issue to deal with. Um, birds of prey also that will um, sometimes attack lambs. Um, and then sometimes you might have issues with bears as well. Um, so all of these animals generally they will live with the flock so you don't want to get a dog that's going to be really too friendly to people because you don't want them following you around instead of staying with the flock. If you don't want to get guard animals, you're not able to get guard animals. You can also think about different fencing, maybe bringing them into a barn at night or into a smaller, um, smaller paddock that's near a barn that has a, a electrified, um, electrified fence and maybe having like wires buried to be able to prevent predators from crawling under or things like that. And then you can also do lethal control. So that would be hunting or trapping those predators. But you really want to make sure that you're checking your local laws um, for if you need any kind of license, if you have to maybe prove that they are, um, they are being predators to your herd or flock, um, and make sure that you have any kind of, um, you're following any kind of regulations that might have in your area. So when moving on to kind of different health issues, um, there's really just, there's one main universally recommended um, vaccine for sheep and goats, and that is the CD&T. So that is taking care of the Clostridium perfringens type CND and also tetanus. 
So the Clostridium perfringens um, ca can cause enterotoxemia, which is also known as eating disease. And so this can occur when there's a sudden change in diet. Um, usually if you're kind of giving them a lot of grain all of a sudden, and that's maybe high in like starch or sugars or higher in protein. And these bacteria are already inside the gut of those animals, but it was sudden diet changes, then all of a sudden there's a lot of rapid growth in the numbers of those bacteria and they can release, release toxins. And so that can be a huge problem because then eventually that could potentially kill that animal. So if you give them this vaccine, then they will be not susceptible to those toxins if they do have a sudden change in diet. Um, so it's recommended that lambs and kids get this at six to eight weeks of age, and then a booster um, generally a few weeks later, depending on whatever the, the vaccine you're using gives, um, what it, whatever it says on the bottle. For sheep and goats, there are different, there are more acceptable um, injection sites. If you're giving intramuscular, which is um, if you're going directly into the muscle, you really wanna stay here in this neck area. But if you're doing subcutaneous vaccinations, um, which or subcutaneous medications, you can, which are mean they're under the skin, not directly into the muscle. Um, you can also give kind of in these like elbow pockets or this like flank pocket here, as shown here, and those are acceptable sites as well. So I mentioned earlier that parasites are a huge problem with sheep and goats. I um, mean, the biggest issue, the biggest, the biggest parasite issue they have is the barber pole worm. Um, and so this is the most common um, cause of anemia in these animals. They kind of have a small tooth-like uh, structure where they're uh, inside the stomach, they're lacerating their abomasum and kind of feeding on the blood. And in severe cases, if they have a lot of them, that this can um, kill those animals. So there's a lot of different measures that um, sheep and goat producers can take to manage these different parasites. Um, so one of those ways to monitor parasite load is what's called FAMACHA scoring. And so this is where you're looking kind of inside this eyelid. I'm not just not directly an eyelid, but more the mucous membrane that's close to the eye. And there's a specific way that um, you have to kind of pop out the eyelid. But once you have that, you're looking at this chart and comparing the color to, um, you can see that this one will be like extremely anemic and this one would be really good. Um, there's a lot of like, cause there's a lot of blood flow and uh, red blood cells there. So with this ones and twos are gonna be fine and they don't need to be treated or dewormed. Fours and fives, you definitely want to deworm. And then kind of in the middle here, this is where you also wanna evaluate other factors um, to determine whether you want to treat those animals or not. Um, so the full matcha scoring, there is a certification that if you take um, a class, then you can become certified and then you can get one of these cards here uh, to be able to look at their eyelids and compare. So if you've looked at the FAMACHA score and maybe you have an animal that's kind of borderline on the three and you want to then look at the rest of these um, pieces of what's called the five point check. So you've looked at the eyes and you can look at the jaw shown here that's called bottle jaw where there's a lot of like buildup of fluid right under the, under the jaw. Um, you also wanna take into account their body condition score. Um, you can look at their tail or DAG scores, which is really just the buildup of manure, um, which can be an indicator of something like a scours or diarrhea. And then you also wanna look at um, the nose in sheep, because if there's discharge, that can be an indicator of nasal bots. But for goats, you wanna look at their um, coat. So you want smooth, um, like healthy, shiny looking hair, not a really rough, coarse hair that's really unthrifty looking. And so when you look at all of these things, if you have like a FOMACHA score of three, but you have some other issues, maybe they have um, a body condition score of two or less, then you're really gonna wanna deworm them. Um, even sometimes, even if they just have a body condition score two or less, you wanna deworm them more frequently um, because they are more susceptible to parasites, but then you also want to be taking a look at your nutrition um, and how that factors in. And so the reason we do these checks and not just deworming 
all of the whole herd is because there's also, because parasites are present problem with small ruminants, um, parasite resistance to deworming products is also a growing issue. So if you are treating everybody, even though they don't need it, um, or you're not treating enough or something like that, then some of these parasites can become resistant to the products that you're using and then they won't work anymore. And then you're gonna have you know, more sheep dying or more sheep getting sick and not producing well because they have all this parasite load that you really can't do anything about. And so that's why we also recommend every couple of years, maybe I'm reevaluating, maybe switching the deworming product that you're using to reduce that incidence of um, parasitic resistance. And then another um, monitoring tool that you can use are fecal egg counts. And so what this is, is you're looking at, uh, as the name says, you're looking at samples of their feces and you're gonna count how many eggs are in that because as the parasites are inside them and they're laying eggs, those eggs are being shed um, out with the feces. And so the way this is done is there's a making a flotation solution, um, which is a saline solution um, that even you could do at home um, if you wanted to. And so this will cause the eggs to separate from any kind of debris and they'll float to the top. And you take a sample of that liquid and you put it into this a slide called a McMaster slide that has a grid, which you can't really see in this picture. It's a little, not quite dark enough, but um, then the grid is there to help you with counting. And you then you would count how many eggs, such as um, here's an egg, and then these two um, are also eggs. And you would count how many eggs within the, the grid. Um, then you would use a formula to calculate how many eggs per gram, which is gonna give you an idea of the parasite load um, of that animal. So, um, these, another way these are useful, not just for um, looking at eggs, but also for if you do them before and after dewarming, you can tell how effective your dewormer is and how much they reduce the parasite load of your animals. So this is another area where it's really important to keep good records of your treatments um, and things like that. And that can also help you select for animals that are more parasite resistant. But just as a note, um, fecal egg counts don't tell the whole story and they're not reliable for diagnosing disease, looking at just an, on an individual basis um, because you'll have some individuals that are more resistant, some that are more susceptible. So you don't wanna ever just look at the egg count itself and knowing and saying, okay, this one needs to be treated or this one doesn't. Um, sometimes two sheep may have the same egg count but if they have different Camacho scores or different body conditions, then maybe one should be treated, but not the other. And it just, you have to look at all the different factors. Um, it's also because eggs are not evenly distributed and they also can uh, vary based on the season, on um, the treatment history of the animal, age, um, and other conditions. So you really can't, I can't give you a number and say, oh, if you're above this, they need to be treated. You really need to look at the whole scope of everything that's going on um, in your flock or herd. So then if you're raising these animals for meat, there's a couple different ways that you can market those. Um, as I said, there's not really a whole lot of feedlots um, for small ruminants here on the East Coast, but you can still sell animals through auction, whether that's um, younger lambs, if you're selling them at market weight. Um, if you have a larger herd, maybe you can also contract with somebody or if you wanted to raise them and feed them out, I'm gonna have them harvested, you can direct market those animals yourself um, as meat, but you want to make sure that you are checking regulations um, to make sure that um, if you're trying, depending on whether you're trying to sell to like in a farm store or a farmer's market or stuff like that, and make sure that everything um, is, you know, legal in the way you're doing. Uh, we also do have um, here in New York, we have a meat sweet tool that was developed um, by Cornell. And so that is a website that will connect um, producers with consumers of meat. So producers can have profiles and say what kind of meats they offer and any different like packages they have, whether they sell um, for small ruminants, maybe like if you're selling a half or a whole animal as meat or if you have different boxes and then consumers can search on that website and find um, farmers selling meat like near them within their area of how many, however many miles they want. There are a lot of um, also ethnic 
um, holidays that are really have lamb um, or serving goat as really a central part of their traditions um, with their holiday meals. So here's just a list of a lot of the holidays that um, you wanna be aware of if you're raising sheep and goats, because there are always people that will be looking for um, those animals. Um, and you do, sometimes they'll be looking for different ages, some for some holidays or some groups they want um, really young ones. So just being aware of that and where you can find the market for um, your animals that you're raising. And then of course, with wool, um, which is interesting about wool is that it used to really be the predominant product um, that was the goal of raising sheep. But now, um, since it's more of a byproduct with the rise of like synthetic fibers and things like that, it's clothes aren't exclusively made from wool anymore. Um, but if you wanna market those, there are wool pools in the state of New York, meaning a lot of producers, they get together and they all kind of sell their, they get their wool together and they all sell it as like a bigger, um, a larger bulk um, grouping. Um, you also might be able to find some uh, local vendors that maybe are, want to process wool or want to use wool and make you know crafts or things like that that they sell. And of course, you also have the option of processing it yourself. And there's a couple of different steps that I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but basically you're going to need to clean it, you're going to comb it, um, and then you can uh, spin it or do whatever with it if you're interested in doing those, keeping those things for yourself. And so with any livestock or farm animal species or really any animal in general, it's really important to have a veterinarian client patient relationship, which means that you have a veterinarian um, and they know you, they know your animals, they know your uh, the goals you have for your herder flock. And so they can help you out and doing consulting with you on things like what vaccinations might be good, maybe what kind of deworming schedule you should have, um, you know, things with nutrition as well. Um, and things like that. Are there any questions? Grace, I don't have a question, but I wanted to direct people to some additional sheep and goat educational resources. So Cornell's, Cornell has a commercial goat and sheep farm discussion group that meets semi-regularly. And I'm going to put a link in the chat. They have the recordings of their previous meetings and additional sheep and goat resources on their YouTube playlist. And the group meets semi-regularly. So if you are a sheep or goat farmer, I can send, um, I'll also put the information in the chat for joining the link or joining the group. Yeah, that's definitely a great thing to point out. Um, they also have a listserv as well that they send out updates and information on too. Do we have any other questions? Well, hearing none, we can end for today, but just know that Grace, Michelle, and I are available via email or phone if you have questions after you leave the session today. And we look forward to seeing you next week or in two weeks. In two weeks, yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Grace. Everyone. Thank you.